our opening words this morning come from Gretchen Haley. What is going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? These days we find ourselves too often stuck with questions on repeat. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? We grasp at signs and markers, articles of news and analysis, Facebook memes and forwarded emails, as if the new Zodiac, capable of forecasting all that life may bring our way, as if we could pair, as if we had ever made any promise of making sense the way we thought, as if we are not also actors in the still unfolding story. For this hour, we gather to surrender to the mystery, to release ourselves from the needing to know, the yearning to have it all already figured out, and also the burden of believing that we have all of the control or none. Here in our song and our silence, our stories and our sharing, we make space for a new breath, a new healing, a new possibility. To take root that is courage forged in the fire of our coming together and felt in the spirit that comes alive with this act of faith, that we believe still a new world is possible. <laughs> that we are creating it already here and now. Come, let us worship together. The theme for worship today is magic and mystery of myth. And we begin with gathering music that it might offer us entry into this time. The song presented here is something just like this by the Chainsmokers. Good morning. My name is Karma Amos and I'm honored to serve as the Minister of the Unitarian Universalists of Central Delaware and to welcome you to worship this morning. Whether it's your first time with us or coming here every week as part of your regular routine, we're glad that you're here and hope that you will find room in this community for your spirit. We continue to be grateful for technology that allows us to worship together online and to continue to build a real community in ways when we cannot gather together in person. Thank you in advance for your patience and grace with any delays or glitches we may experience. In addition to our worship each Sunday at 10, we meet on Tuesday nights at 7 for a more informal time of checking in and sharing. Please consider joining us for that gathering. And by way of announcement this morning, we do have children's RV today beginning at 12 o'clock. And I also want to take a moment to thank our tech folks who've been working overtime this week, shifting our Zoom and training more people to assist us with our online worship and programming. And if you'd like to join that group of folks and volunteer from time to time, please do let me know. Now I invite you to take a deep breath and listen to these sincere words of welcome. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, whatever your religious beliefs are or aren't, and wherever you physically are on the planet right now, you are welcome in this spiritual community. However you move in this world, how much or how little is in your bank account or wallet, However you're feeling in this moment, you and all of who you are, are welcome in this spiritual community. We are all enhanced by being together. This morning's chalice lighting is by George Kimish Beach. In the mystery of life about us, there is light. It gives us a place to be, to grow, to rejoice together. It opens the pathways to love. In this place of friendship, there is freedom. Let the light we kindle before us, strong in hope, wide in goodwill, inviting the day to come. Now, please join me in our unison affirmation. The words are in the chat box for you. 
Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. And please join us by singing along in your own space in our opening song. It is, it's in every one of us by David Pomerantz. Each week in our worship, we highlight something that connects us with the broader Unitarian Universalist Association of which we are a part. We hope this expands both our thinking and our relationships. For our UU moments in the month of March, we honor Women's History Month. We are highlighting some famous women in the history of Unitarian Universalism. We begin this week by sharing with you about Judith Sargent Murray, who was a prominent essayist of the American Republic. She was an early advocate of women's equality, access to education, and the right to control her own earnings. Her essay titled On the Equality of the Sexes was published a year before Mary Wollstonecroft's renowned 1792 Vindication of the Rights of Women. Born on May 1st, 1751 in Gloucester, Massachusetts, Murray was the oldest of eight children of the wealthy merchant family of Winthrop Sargent and Judith Songer Sargent. With reading and writing the only education typical for women of her time, Murray relied on the vast family library to teach herself history, philosophy, geography, and literature. At age nine, she began writing poetry. In 1769, Murray married John Stevens, a ship captain and they adopted his orphan nieces and her cousin. During the American Revolution, however, Gloucester's shipping industry suffered. Stevens was facing debtor's prison by war's end. In 1784, Murray tried publishing under a pseudonym to end their financial woes, but to no avail. Stevens fled to the West Indies where he died in 1786. Two years later, Judith Sargent married John Murray, a Unitarian Universalist minister she met years earlier and to whom her family had given land to build America's first Universalist Unitarian meeting house in 1780. Throughout, Murray built a literary life, often writing under a pseudonym, sometimes as Honora, Marticia or Constantia. In 1792, she assumed a male identity and pen name, The Gleaner, for her column in the Massachusetts Magazine. The family moved to Boston the next year where Murray's play, The Medium in 1765, was likely the first by an American author to be produced on stage. Murray also published poetry. We are proud to list Judith Sargent Murray among our UU ancestors. It is now our time of joys and concerns when we offer one another the opportunity to share very briefly what is most on our hearts right now, life celebrations and concerns. As you do so, we invite you to light a candle in your own space. Through the action of sharing and kindling a flame, we give energy to our best thoughts and meditations, sympathies, celebrations, and prayers. We hold these as sacred in our collective hearts. We would also like to invite anyone new to our community to introduce yourselves if you would like. We welcome you warmly and would be pleased to light a candle in honor of your connection with us. 
and whatever joys and concerns you carry in your hearts. At this time, we invite you to change your view to gallery view in the upper right corner of your screen so that you can see everyone who is here. As you feel led, please unmute your microphone, share your joy and concern, and light your candle if you have one. You can watch the mute signals on the lower left of each person's video stream to see if anyone else is unmuted. It's best if we share one at a time. Please remember to, remove, to mute your mic after you have shared. We light one final candle for the joys and concerns that were not spoken by those of us here and in solidarity with others in our community who could not be with us today. A central part of our worship in person and online is the opportunity we all have to practice the art of generosity and in the spirit and practice of gratitude. Our gifts to you, UCD, are what allowed this congregation to thrive with a common vision to nurture our spirits, build our community, and change the world. We are grateful to you for the many ways you support our community, including your financial pledges and offerings. Your gifts matter, and it's one of the ways you make this world a better place. Thank you for your passion and your generosity. For those who are making pledges or who want to contribute to this community, you may continue to write checks and mail them to us, or you can give online. There are instructions to do both these things on our website at uucd.org. Just click support UUCD on the menu bar. And you can do this during this offering song or at any time that's convenient. This song is Melody from Orpheus and Eurydice, one of the one of opera's masterpieces by Christoph Willebach Fluke.
For our centering today, we take a few moments to ponder the insights of Robert Fulgham in his book, All I Really Need to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. First, settle into your body and take a few deep breaths. In and out. In and out. Consider these thoughts. I believe that imagination is stronger than knowledge. That myth is more potent than history. That dreams are more powerful than facts. that hope always triumphs over experience. That laughter is the only cure for grief. And I believe that love is stronger than death. Now, what is it that you believe or know How did you gain that knowledge? And how have you passed it on to others? What is your story? Our reading today is from Jeanette Winterson in Wait. Right now, human beings as a mass have a gruesome appetite for what they call real. Whether it's reality TV or the kind of plotting fiction that only works as low grade documentary. Or at the better end, the factual programs and autobiographies and true life accounts that occupy the space where imagination used to sit. Such a phenomenon points to a terror of the inner life, of the sublime, of the poetic, of the non-material, of the contemplative. Against all this, a writer such as myself who believes in the power of storytelling for its mythic and not its explanatory qualities, and who believes that language is much more than information must row against the tide, rather like Siegfried rowing against the current of the Rhine. Myth is a marvelous way of telling stories, retelling stories for their own sakes, and finding in them permanent truths about human nature. All we can do is keep telling the stories, hoping that someone will hear hoping that in the noisy echoing nightmare of endlessly breaking news and celebrity gossip, other voices might be heard, speaking of the life of the mind and the soul's journey. Once upon a time, in a land not so far away, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, to be precise, I was sitting in a seminary lecture hall in a class on the Hebrew Bible. When it came time for me to ask a question, I prefaced it by saying something about the creation mythology contained in the book of Genesis. And the student sitting next to me had an absolute conniption fit because I used the word myth in reference to the Bible. I'm talking serious histrionics here. And I was taken aback. Apparently, he was both a creationist and a literalist, someone who believes the whole in the beginning story of God creating the world in six days and resting on the seventh is literal history, and that understanding it in some other way, as I did, was not only misguided, but sinful. But what became clear to me is that his definition of the word myth was completely different from my own. For him, myth meant false or untrue. 
while for me, myth is a genre of storytelling that seeks to convey universal truths in a deeper way than can be captured by facts. As Jeanette Winterson says in the introduction of Wake, which is her retelling of the story of Atlas, myths hold power that, go, that goes beyond the explanatory to invite people into a story that is about more than simple information. It's about conveying permanent truths about human nature that get to the heart of what it means to be alive. And I agree with her that it's indicative of a deficiency of the inner life, the poetic, the sublime, the imagination, when we dismiss the deeper truth of myth in favor of only just the facts, ma'am. So rather than dismiss myth as something false, fake, or frivolous, I want to invite us today to explore its magic and its mystery. My great grandmother was an amazing woman. One of the things that she did later in her life, when she was 52 years old, in fact, was to go back to college to get her degree in literature so that she could become a high school teacher. Now she had forgone college because my great grandfather, who was not a bad guy, wanted her to stay home and take care of the house and the kids. Well, she finally had enough of that and asserted her own right for self-determination. She graduated a few years later and at just the time many people her age were beginning to think about retirement, she was getting enthusiastically started in a new career and her favorite class to teach was the course on Greek mythology. I was fortunate enough to have her in my life most of the time I was growing up and I adored it when she would tell me the stories. And always after she shared, she would ask me, what did you notice? What does that story tell you about life? And we would talk and imagine together. My favorite story as a child was the one about Athena, springing forth from the head of her father Zeus, fully grown, wise, strong, and ready to rumble. And talking with my great grandmother about the goddess Athena taught me something about the power and potential of women. Specifically, it made me feel more confident and more committed to developing my own gifts. In some ways, that story encouraged me to dream bigger, to question the norms of what society, especially in my small hometown, thought possible for girls. It increased my ambition. So for me, myths were always something captivating and life-giving, even if it was many years before I could articulate exactly why that was so. Many of you have may have seen the famous PBS series of interviews with Joseph Campbell and Bill Moyers in which they explore the power of myth. Like Winterson, they conclude that Western society on the whole lacks some of the stability and the unity that it previously derived from being educated in the mythology and legends of the Greek and Roman classics. Many educational programs in the US have eliminated classics as a required course of study, or at least made it an elective. And Campbell argued that the lack of association with mythology leaves us less able to relate to our role in the world, less able to find meaning in our experiences through the various stages of life, birth, love, loss, war, death, for Campbell, myth is, quote, the song of the universe, the music of the spheres, and it enhances life. I think that our society's lack of appreciation of myth also contributes in some ways to our separation from the earth. I'm fascinated by the mythological concept of the dream time in Australian Aboriginal culture as just one example. The dream time is what Aboriginal people refer to as their in the beginning, their creation mythology. It describes a time way back when the world was being created by spirits and the ancestors. 
and the stories of the dream time tell about the ways in which the mysterious actions of the spirits formed the land, the rivers, the mountains, the hills, the plants, the animals and the people. And there's a lovely phrase in some of the stories that goes like this, in the beginning when the world was soft. And some of the stories talk about the ways in which the spirits took on the form of serpents or other animals and their actions and their movements on the soft world are what left behind the tracks of the rivers and the sculpting of the landscape. In Aboriginal culture, there is an intimacy with the earth, a respect for its beauty and its resources that is still nurtured by the vibrancy of the Dreamtime myths. I can't help but think that we citizens of the US in particular might not have some, such a detached and consumeristic relationship with the planet if we honored the magic of myth and kept our own mythologies alive. And like the Aboriginal spirits and ancestors, actions and motions shaped the earth, we certainly know that ours do too. That's one of those deeper truths worthy of our reflection. Myths also pull us into reflection and understanding about human nature and our relationships with ourselves and with one another. I was talking with someone just this week who made an offhand reference to the story of Narcissus. And that's all he had to say for me to know exactly what was being described. Something much deeper than the, weird, the mere words themselves. Narcissus, of course, was an extraordinarily beautiful lad. And one summer, the goddess Nemesis lured him to a pool of water where he saw for the first time his own reflection, his beauty. He didn't know that it was himself, he thought it was someone else and thus immediately fell in love with and was forever unable to stop staring at the object of his affection. When he realized that his love was not reciprocated, that he could not possess what had so captured his heart and soul, he eventually died there by the water. Now, by referencing this story, the person I was speaking with pointed to the risk that any one of us can face if we get too stuck in self-obsession. And we know that to be true, right? One lesson we might take away from this is the need we all have from time to time to get over ourselves, to move beyond our self-interest and consider the bigger picture. It's a lesson all people need to learn and probably more than once. Often, Myths invite us into a deeper kind of knowing that can, if we will enter the mystery, enhance the lives we're living and make us better people. Let me give another example. I'm sure you're familiar with the work of religious scholar and historian Karen Armstrong. She was one of the first recipients of an early award from the TED Foundation that let her make a wish for something that might positively transform the world. And her wish was to begin the Charter for Compassion. She believes that compassion, a thread woven throughout all great religions, is one of the only forces that holds the potential to heal all the terrible and painful divisions that exist between people and between nations around the world. And at the beginning of her TED Talk, in which she tries to make the case for this, she recounts an ancient myth from the Iliad. She says to the audience, you know the story of the Iliad, the 10 year war between Greece and Troy. In one incident, Achilles, the famous warrior of Greece, takes his troops out of the war and the whole war effort suffers. And in the course of the ensuing muddle, his beloved friend, Patroclus is murdered, killed in hand-to-hand -hand combat by one of the Trojan princes named Hector. And Achilles goes mad with grief and rage and revenge. He kills Hector, he mutilates his body, 
and then he refuses to give the body back to the family for burial, which in Greek ethos means that Hector's soul will wander eternally lost. And then one night, Priam, king of Troy, at the time an old man, comes into the Greek camp incognito, makes his way to Achilles' tent to ask for the body of his beloved son. And everyone is shocked when the old man takes off his head covering and shows himself. Achilles looks at the old man and thinks of his own father and he starts to weep. And Priam looks at Achilles, the man who had killed so many of his sons and he too starts to weep. And the sound of their weeping filled the house. The Greeks believed that weeping together created a bond between people. So Achilles takes the body of Hector and hands it very tenderly to the father. And the two men look at each other and see each other as divine. Now, as my great grandmother would say, what does this story teach you about life? Quite a lot, I think. And it doesn't matter a whiff if it ever happened, because that's not the point. That's not the language of myth. The point is, at least one point, is how important it is to learn to see the goodness, the sacredness in other human beings, and then to cultivate respect, compassion, and authentic connection so that we can avoid mutual and senseless destruction. Myths teach us what it means to be human and divine, and what it means to become better humans. They can expose our shadow sides, our pettiness, our egotism, our flaws, and they can also summon us to be better, to funnel our limited energies into things like love, forgiveness, kindness, generosity, collaboration, and healing. Joseph Campbell, whom I mentioned earlier, says that myth functions to make the world, quote, transparent to transcendence transparent to transcendence by showing us that underneath the world of phenomena lies an eternal source that is constantly pouring its energies into this world of time, suffering, and ultimately death. And he says that to achieve this task, it is necessary to speak of things that existed before and beyond words, which seems impossible but which can be done through the mystery and the metaphor of myth. Mythologies are passed on in stories, in rituals, in religions, in rites of passage and special ceremonies like marriages and quinceañeras and funerals. Myths exist in every culture. They contain the raw material that inspires music, art, drama, poetry, language, even food. Myths function to instruct us in the stuff of life and love, to honor the stages of our lives, to emphasize the ways in which we are related to one another in deep and mysterious ways through generations upon generations, through thousands and thousands of years. They function also to give us purpose and to awaken us to beauty and transcendence. It is, I think, to our detriment that we do not give them enough attention. We don't sit often enough with the myths and legends of the ages and the ancients. And so today, I simply wanna give a shout out to the magic and the mystery of myth and encourage us to spend some time reflecting on them. Maybe it's the Greek and Roman classics. Maybe it's the dream time. Maybe it's the stories from the indigenous peoples of the world that describe how the world works. Maybe it's Star Wars, another fascination of Campbell's. Or maybe to loop back to where I began, 
It's the mythologies that the major religions share in common. Maybe it's something altogether different. Whatever it is for you, I hope you will consider this to be an invitation to spend some time with it in the coming days or weeks. Listen again to the stories, reflect on them, and don't forget to ask yourself, what did you notice? What do these stories teach us about life? Because somewhere between the stories and us lies wisdom. Our closing song today is We Are by Isaiah Barnwell. And this was performed by the UUA uh, General Assembly Virtual Choir last year. Sing along in your own environment, if you will. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Oh, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Oh, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are our grandmother's prayers, and we are our grandfather's dreamings, and we are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We Mothers of courage, fathers of time, daughters of dust, and the sons of great visions, we're sisters of mercy, brothers of love, lovers of life, and the builders of nations, we're seekers of truth, keepers of faith, makers of peace, and the wisdom of ages, we are. Grandmother's prayers, we are our grandfather's dreamings, and we are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We are mothers of courage, fathers of time, daughters of dust, and the sons of great visions. We're sisters of mercy, brothers of love. Lovers of life and the builders of nations, we're seekers of truth and keepers of faith. We are makers of peace and the wisdom of ages. We are our grandmother's prayers. We, we are our grandfather's dreamings and we are the breath of our ancestors. We the spirit of God, we are our grandmother's prayers, and we are our grandfather's dreamings. We are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe. Child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are one. Please join me in the extinguisher chalice. The words are in the chat box. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our closing words are from Bruce Southworth. In our hungering for deeper meaning, 
in our aching for friendship, in our yearning for justice, in our hearts remembering of ancient wisdom and finer days, may we look deep within the mystery of things and gather our strength. May each of us proclaim in every way we can the graceful power of life and love so we may live in hope. Amen. Our virtual worship has ended, but our connection to one another and the earth endures. Go blessed to be a blessing for others.